and we are live on the Three Chord Strand Conference Call. I'm Derek Day, and um, we just got finished praying and getting started here, so we're going to go ahead and, and get to it. And today I want to talk about a subject that is near and dear to me, and, and it's one that I think a lot of people have a lot of trouble with. It's one of those um, straining at a net, swallowing a camel kind of things. And, it, and it's this, it's the whole concept of hell and, and what hell is. And this is one of these things that I have really, really struggled with. And, and in recent times, uh, God has taken me through this amazing journey concerning um, quote-unquote eternal punishment. Now, let me say this for the record, that um, I'm personally not an inclusionist. I'm not a universalist. I don't knock those who are because uh, most of the ones that I've met are, are really loving people and, and their hearts are really in the right place. I just don't, I don't agree with that theological perspective. But, but that being said, let me just give you a, a story. I, I'm sitting out here on my patio and to my left over here is my world famous grill and smoker. I say world famous because I like to smoke and grill a lot of stuff. And I post pictures of it on social media whenever I do it. And, uh, and I think that I do it pretty well. But part of the process of smoking meat is building a sustaining fire. And when you're building this fire, this fire has to get white hot. And, and, and you have to set it aside in such a way that it, that, that it produces enough heat and smoke to cook the meat, but not enough to incinerate it, okay? So here's, here's the deal. One day, me and my, my namesake, which is my second to youngest son, is Derek, Derek the second or Derek Jr., um, we are standing beside the grill and I'm, and I'm watching the fire. I mean, fire is an awesome thing. I mean, it's, it's like fire transforms a lot of things. And I'm looking at this fire, and as I'm looking at this fire, God speaks to me. And he asked me a very pointed question. He said, does your son ever disobey you? And I'm like, well, yeah, Lord, he does said, does he ever disappoint you? I said, well, you know, people disappoint you, Lord. Yeah, that, that's happened. And, and then God asked me, he said, would you throw your son into this fire if he completely disregarded you? I was like, wow, God, that's a heavy, heavy question. No, I, I wouldn't. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't do anything to harm him. I, I couldn't wish so much as a toothache on him. You know, it, it's like, God, he's like, he looks like me. <laughs> you know, he's my, my image and my likeness. He's my flesh and blood. He contains my DNA. It's, it, it's like I, I was there when he, you know, when he popped out of the oven. And, and, and no, God, I just couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. And here's what God said to me. He said, neither would I. This was one of the most profound conversations I ever had with God. And it took me a minute to process this because the, the whole Christian narrative centers around this heaven and hell thing. That, that if there's a heaven, an eternal reward, then there too must be a hell and an eternal punishment. And this is, this is hard stuff. Now, I'm, let me give you a fair warning. I, I would highly suggest 
and this is just me, and not because I'm teaching this, but because, because this is what God has given me, I would highly suggest that you stick around and, and at least hear what I have to say. But if you are fixed in the, in the dogmatic perception that, that there must be an eternal punishment that sinners have to pay, well, I'm just going to tell you up front, I'm going to piss you off and you might want to change the channel. Because if that's, if that's where you are, if that's your headspace, if that's where you are spiritually, I, listen, I don't, it's not my desire to upset your apple cart. But if you want to experience freedom, and this is Freeology Friday, and I call it Freeology Friday because I, I, I use freedom to bust up theology. And so it's, your, it's free theology or freeology. You got it? Good. And here it is. I think that, that hell is perhaps the single most misunderstood, misconstrued, mistaught, misapplied doctrine in all of Christendom. And I'm going to tell you why. Because mankind, is created in the image and the likeness of God. But man has recreated God in his image and likeness. And the nature of man tends to vengeance. And that's what it's about. So without any further ado, let me go to some scripture here because I don't want y'all to think that I'm just that I'm just pulling rabbits out of my hat. <laughs> I, I want you to know that there is an exegetical, and that's a fancy theological word saying that I'm extracting or drawing from the scripture uh, point to all of this. And here we go. I'm going to start with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, and I'm reading from the Amplified. Um, take that, you King James only. <laughs> Yet grace, that is God's unmerited favor, was given to each of us individually, not indiscriminately, but in different ways, in proportion to the measure of Christ's rich and bountiful gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. That is, he led a train of vanquished foes, and he bestowed gifts upon men. But that he ascended, now what can this he ascended mean, but that he had previously descended from the heights of heaven into the depths, that is the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the very same as he who has ascended high above all the heavens, that he in his presence might fill all things, that is the whole universe from the lowest to the highest. First of all, there you got to understand that in order to get to this hell thing, we need to take some theological leaps. Because if you were trying to explain the concept of hell as we understand it today to an old covenant Hebraic mindset, that Hebraic mindset will give you a head tilt. They give you a head cock. Like, oh, what do you mean? What is this hell you speak of? Why? Because there was no construct for a hell in the Old Covenant. There was in, nowhere in the, in the Old Testament is hell as a construct discussed. Yes, there was Sheol, the place of the dead. The place of the dead. Didn't say that it was a place of eternal torment or, an et or eternal torture. And, 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 and so then we fast forward to Jesus and he's given the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And, and, and this is where a lot of our theology on hell comes from. Because it says that, you know, the, the, the rich man says, you know, let me go back to my brothers and tell them that, that, that such a place exists. 
And, 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 and Abraham tells him, well, you know, you, you, you have the, the prophets and they didn't, they didn't listen to them. And, and from that, from that exchange, we come, with, we come up with an, an entire doctrine of a, pla of a place of eternal fire and torment. But let me go back to the scripture for a second, right? Because it said in verse 8, Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Stop right there. What does this mean that he led captivity captive? Well, very simply, it says that he descended into the lower parts of the earth. The lower parts of the earth cons constitutes the place of the dead, Sheol. In other words, Jesus went into Sheol and took all the souls out of there. Didn't say that he left any behind. Said he led captivity captive. And, and, and captivity means all, and all means all, y'all. You with me? Now, so watch this. Jesus led captivity captive. He descended before he ascended. He went down into the place of the dead and took every single soul out of there. Now, let, 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 me, let, me, let me keep going here because I want to go to Revelation 1.18. Revelation 1.18. And it says, And the ever-living one, I am living in the eternity of eternities. This is Jesus speaking. I died, but see, I'm alive forevermore. And I possess the keys of death and Hades, that is the realm of the dead. You know, we, we in, in Christian circles, you hear, well, Jesus has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Well, great. If he, if he does have the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and that because he has the keys to death, we have the key to everlasting life. If he has the key to the grave, then that means that, oh, death, where is the sting? Oh, grave, where is the victory? That, that means that, that he has the key. We, we, we have the key to get out of the grave. But, but, but wait, if, if this is hell that he's speaking of, we, we got out of death. <laughs> we got out of the grave. So, so this hell thing, we're not talking, first of all, we're not taking, we're not talking about the place of fiery torment. Now, let me go back to that. Matthew chapter 18, verse 7 and 9, 7 through 9. And it says, Woe to the world for such temptations to sin and influences to do wrong. It is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the person on whose account by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or foot causes you to stumble and sin, cut it off and throw it away for it from you. For it is better, that is more profitable and wholesome, for you to enter in inner life maimed or lame than to have two hands or feet and be thrown into everlasting fire. This everlasting fire, let me give you a first century Jewish perspective of this. There is a valley outside of Jerusalem that's called Gehenna. And Gehenna was a flaming garbage dump. That's what it was. And, and, the, and the fires of Gehenna had burned for centuries. The fire never went out. So when you spoke of eternal fire to a first century Jew, they only understood this. Because again, there was no construct of hell in the Old Testament. Are you with me? See, it's going to blow your mind, but at the same time, it's going to help you walk in a freedom that you have never experienced. I promise you. But let me keep going. Verse 9. And if your eye causes you to stumble and sin, pluck it out and throw it away from you, for it is better, that is more profitable and wholesome, for you to enter life with only one eye then have two eyes and be thrown into, into the hell, Gehenna, it says here, of fire. Now, now watch this. It says to enter into life, to enter into life with only one eye. First of all, if, if, if we go into Christ, first of all, we go into Christ. Christ is about wholeness, completion, nothing broken, nothing lacking. So, so and, and Jesus was obviously speaking 
figuratively here about cutting off hands and plucking out eyes. Why? Because you'd be crazy if you sit up here and pluck your eye out or cut your hand off. I don't care how big of a sinner you think you are. That is just absolutely stark raving nuts. And what Jesus was doing here was using a, a, a tool, a teaching tool called hyperbole. In other words, he was making a totally ridiculous point or using a totally ridiculous device to make a perfectly logical point. That's what is happening here. Jesus isn't saying, well, you better, you, you better cut, pluck your eye out or, or cut your hand off or you're going to hell. If that were the case, man, do you know that there would have been a whole bunch of people cutting, plucking eyes out and cutting hands off? You, you would have seen this all throughout the New Covenant, but you didn't see this. Why? Because Jesus wasn't speaking literally. More to the point. Nowadays, people want to talk about hellfire and people who are in danger of hellfire because they smoke, drink, cuss, or chew, or run around with those who do. This ain't got nothing to do with this. Yes, I said bad English. This ain't got nothing. Yep, th this is bad English. What Jesus is talking about here is people who mistreat other people and people who, tr who lead people astray. This is not talking, you know who Jesus is talking about here? He's talking about leaders who lead people down the path of legalism and that they themselves won't uphold the very law that they demand that others keep. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about, you know, the M1, A1, you know, uh, uh, prostitute, drunkard, crack addict, or, or whatever, pimp or whatever. He's not talking about them because otherwise Jesus would have, he would have specifically cited these people. And, and watch this. You know, people say, well, God can't look on sin. He didn't, can't look on sin. It says that Jesus is the express image of the Father, Hebrews 1 and 3. Jesus said that the, that the Son only does what he sees the Father do. He said, I and the Father are one. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But Jesus hung out with prostitutes. He hung out with drunkards. He hung out with thugs and tax collectors. This was Jesus' posse. This was his crew. That's who he ran with. And yet and still, you don't ever see him calling any of these people out of, of, over their idiosyncrasies. The only people that you ever see Jesus calling out were the religious leaders who are trying to lead people down these paths of legalism and demanding that they uphold laws that they themselves can't keep. Man, y'all better hear me. This whole kind, and then let me let me just say this too. I got I got a. I got to take a dig at some folks because they're and and, and 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 I'm not taking a dig in a mean spirited way, but I want you to understand this, right? Because there are people that will sit up and they will say, "Well, Jesus taught more on hell than he did on heaven." That is a load of bovine effluvia. Uh, that's a nice way of saying BS. That j listen, Jesus didn't teach more on hell than anything else. In fact, he really didn't teach on hell a lot. The only time that he talked about hell and the people who were in danger of hell were those people who mistreated, those who didn't love, those who didn't have empathy or compassion toward others. Those were the people. And, and watch this. The, the whole thing about Gehenna was this. If you were a first century Jew, if you died, it's just like today. When people die, they want to die nicely. They want the nice funeral. They want the nice casket. They want the nice clothes. They want the nice flowers. They want the nice church. They want the nice preacher. They want the nice pallbearers. They want all of these things, right? Because people like to die well. Well, watch this, right? If you died and you had a tomb to be buried in, that was, that was a sign of your status in society. But if you were lowly in society, well, they just took your dead carcass and tossed it in Gehenna, where the flame never quenches and the worm never turns. <laughs> 
You got to catch this. In, in other words, this is this is what people fear. They didn't fear going to hell and eternal fire because that was something they didn't comprehend because that was something that the law and the prophets didn't cover. Nobody was taught that. That was never covered. That's not part of the it's not part of of Judaism, and it, and it's honestly not part of Christendom. Where all of this comes from is a guy named Dante who wrote a, a a divine comedy called The Inferno, where you know where people went into this eternal lake of fire and burned forever. That's Dante, man. That ain't Jesus. <laughs> Are you with me, y'all? That that's 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 a, that's a work of fiction. And yet this persists as some kind of teaching, some kind of construct as to what we can expect in the afterlife. And this is why that happens. Because again, God created us in his image, but man has recreated God in his image. Watch this. If, if, if you are a, a, a rapist or a serial killer, or if you are a habitual thief or a liar, or if you're a homosexual or whatever it is, there must be a special place for you because why you're dirty and filthy and you're contrary to the whole concept of the gospel teaching. Ah, you, you, you have to burn forever. That ain't God. Because watch this. There is absolutely no love in that. See, the thing is, is that you, you, get, you have to look at this. God is love. You know, in, in 1 John, John wrote, God is love. If God is love, then everything about him is good. Because everything about love is good. There is nothing. If you want to know what love is, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and read through that and see what love is. Love, love ain't tough. Love ain't, uh, it, it ain't hard. L love is not... Uh, punishing. It, love isn't any of those things. If, if you're looking for the characteristics of love scripturally, that's where you find it. And it ain't there. It ain't there. But, but people want vengeance. And, and watch this. Let me, let me, I'm going to take you to two passages of scripture here, right? Uh, because, um, when <laughs> Jesus was, uh, he was, he was preaching, in Luke chapter 4, uh, verses 18 through 21, and this is the first time that we see Jesus in a synagogue. And he has the scroll of what we normally would call Isaiah 61. Now I'm going to read Isaiah 61, and then I'm going to read Luke chapter 4, because I want to compare and contrast, and I want to use a fancy word here. I want to juxtapose these two passages of scripture, that is to bring them side by side for comparison and contrast. And you're going to see something here. Watch this, because this is people. This is people. This ain't God. Hell has nothing to do with God. It has to do with people. Watch. Or, or the, con the modern construct of hell has to do with people. Watch this. Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed and, qual and qualified me to preach the gospel of good tidings to the meek the poor and afflicted. He has sent me to bind up and heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the physical and spiritual captives and the opening of the prison and the, and the eyes of, of those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, that is the year of his favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Watch this, the day of vengeance, right? See, this is, this is the thing. See, when, when, when God said, vengeance is mine, I shall recompense. Every, everybody's like figuring that, okay, all these people that have, that have brought uh, the Jews and the captive from Pharaoh on down, you know, that, that God has got to have, he's got to exact vengeance upon them because these are his chosen people. So watch this. We fast forward some thousand years and we have... Jesus in the synagogue. And, and I'm going to add a little uh, added narrative for effect and impact. So what, what you're going to hear from me in between the readings of the words of Jesus are my interpretation of the crowd's reaction to this. Because mind you, as Jesus is reading this, 
Jerusalem is under siege. It's occupied by the Roman army. And the law of Rome has now superseded the law of God, at least in, this, in the natural. So here we go. This is Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Yeah? Yeah? See, watch this. People had heard that this is a possibility that this guy who was speaking, he might just be Christ. He might just be the Messiah. So we, we need to go and hear him. So yeah, yeah, ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, 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 he's, he, he's reading from Isaiah. Ooh, ooh, this is gonna be good. Because he has anointed me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, come on, Jesus. Yeah, come on. To preach this good news. Whoa, oh, the good news. Oh, come on, Jesus. <laughs> We're waiting, Jesus. Come on, come on, Jesus. To the poor. Ooh, I'm poor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for talking to me. Oh, you preaching to me, Jesus. You preaching to me now. He has sent me to announce release to the captives and re recovery of sight to the blind. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Jesus, yeah. To send forth as delivered those who are oppressed. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm oppressed. I'm oppressed. Come on, Jesus. Come on. Come on, Jesus. Who were downtrodden, bruised, crushed, and broken down by calamity. Yeah, 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 yeah. To proclaim the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, here it comes now. Here it comes. Here it comes. The, 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 the day when salvation and the free favor of, God's, of God is profusely abounded. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes of the synagogue were gazing attentively on him. Why were they gazing attentively on him? Because he had led them up to this point. Back in Isaiah, in, 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 in verse 2, 61 and 2, it says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Watch this. They were like, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's getting good. It's getting good. It's getting good. Here it comes. Here it comes. The vengeance is coming. He came to bring a sword. He's going to smite our enemies once and for all. He's going to lay waste to these Roman infidels. And he's going to restore us to our godly place. But, but watch this. He, Jesus got to that part about vengeance and rolled up the scroll. <laughs> uh, my, my friend Jan Hendrik Lamprecht from South Africa had said that, that vengeance for man is, is retributive. But... Uh, but, but for God, it's turning the other cheek. And, and that's what Jesus was doing here. He's, he's like, I'm not going to be the one to give you your vengeance. Because my vengeance is love. So if that being said, if God's vengeance is love and his recompense is grace then you cannot make the case exegetically hermeneutically for an eternal burning place of eternal conscious torment it just isn't there you cannot make that case Now, I tell my kids all the time, don't make a temporary mistake that has permanent consequences. And, and you know, I remember one time my baby, Anthony, took a big rock and threw it through a neighbor's window. Now, he wasn't aiming at the window. He was just throwing the rock. And, and it had bad consequences. And I um, reprimanded Anthony for that. And I paid for the window. And that was seven years ago. Now, 
it would be absolutely reprehensible of me as a father to hold that against him seven years later because he made that mistake that I hold that against him. It would be cruel and unfatherly to punish my son for years for a youthful indiscretion. And yet, we believe, we, we, we'll actually say this, we'll say, well, God is a good father. He's a real good father. It's who he is, who he is. And I'm loved by him. It's who I am. It's who I am. And we'll say that, but he'll burn you in hell if you reject him. <laughs> Y'all help me understand this. Let me take you back to my days in high school. And I was a bit of a shutterbug. Um, I, when, I, when I was younger, I, I, I used to model. And, and, uh, and like most models, I was a little self-absorbed. And, and, but I took a lot of pictures. And um, one of the things that I took a lot of pictures of or I had people take pictures of were me and girls. Yeah, I like girls. And, they, and, and these folks would take pictures of me and girls. And so I'd go down to my photo mat and I'd get the pictures developed. And ultimately, I learned how to develop pictures on my own. And I would develop these pictures. And I'd have all these pictures, hundreds, hundreds of pictures, hundreds, hundreds of pictures of me and girls. Well, you know, the, the way uh, childhood sweethearts and, you know, how love goes in high school, it is not a lasting or permanent thing. It's kind of fleeting. So you have these moments where you look at the picture and you say, man, that picture of me is dope. <laughs> man, I look good in this picture. My hair is tight. I got my mustache trimmed perfectly. I like that tie I'm wearing. Oh, but that girl, <laughs> she, she really pissed me off. She, I got to get her out of this picture. So what you do is you break out your scissors and you start cutting and you cut. And, and if you're good, you cut very carefully and you cut that pretty young thing out of the picture. But in the process, you, you cut a little bit of your afro off or you, or you cut a little bit of your mullet off or you cut a little bit of your ear off or your shoulder. And I don't know about you. But me, every time I harmed a picture of myself, that bothered me. That troubled me. Why? Because that picture is an image and a likeness of me. And I love me some me. So watch this. You got God who's got, you know, there, there are 7 billion known photocopies of God <laughs> walking the earth right now. And billions more that came before us. Can you imagine if, if this troubled me, and I know that it, I've talked with other people and it troubles them, how much more will it trouble God to cut out a little picture of himself and cast it into the fire? I mean, that just, y'all got to get me here from a standpoint of love. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I'll bet you that there ain't nobody that God loves more than himself. God loves him some him. I, I, I even, I've, I've even made uh, an anecdote about this, that before God created man, before he created anything, before he created anything substantive, when he was just sitting up there in the spirit realm, God was just sitting up there dancing around in heaven. Boy, I love me some me. I'm awesome. I'm God, created everything, create, and I'm going to create everything. Why? Because I'm love. I'm love. Man, I'm love. I just got to create because that's what love does. Love creates. I got to create something. I got to make something because that's what I do. You know, it's like, y'all understand, we are God's artwork. We are God's poetry. We are God's song. We are God's sculpture. We are God's magnum opus. <laughs> we... And, and so you don't just take your magnum opus and smash it with a sledgehammer and cast it into the fire. That just don't make sense. And, and, and watch this. People say, well, you know, 
God's thoughts are higher than ours and his ways are not our ways. But he's given us the mind of Christ. And, and nowhere did Jesus condemn anyone. And watch this. Jesus was on the cross. He had been mocked, beaten, scourged, cursed, spit upon. Now he's nailed to these two beams and people are still mocking him. They're, they're like, if you're, the, if you're the son of God, come on down. Save us all. It's what, what the thief said. But watch this. If ever there was a case to condemn a whole bunch of folks to hell, that was the moment. If you want to see God in action, what God does when the chips are down, when God does when he's thoroughly pissed, what God does when he's been thoroughly mocked, when God does when he's been thoroughly spit on, and what God does when he sends himself wrapped in human flesh to meet these human beings face to face, eye to eye, heart to heart, and they rejected him. What does God do? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If ever there was a moment when somebody deserved hell as we understand it, that was it. And guess what? He didn't condemn a single one. He forgave them all. You got to catch that. So if he forgave all of them, how much more is he going to f forgive us? Listen, I have my own thoughts about what, what hell is. And that's, that's another teaching for another time. But suffice it to say that it is not and it can no way be construed in any way, shape, form, or fashion without a lot of theological gymnastics that there is in a place of eternal conscious torment that any human being will wind up in. It just ain't there. It just ain't there. And, and, and when you catch this, see, and, and people say, oh, well, you, you're trying to say that people ain't going to have no punishment or... Watch this. In 1 John, it says, perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. If God has not given us the spirit of fear, then he doesn't expect us to expect punishment. Fear has to do with punishment, not love. It says, perfect love casts out fear. Because fear, has, the only reason why you fear anything is because you fear the consequences of something. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to have faith in the consequences of God's love. That he loves you and that he wants to forgive you. Matter of fact, God has already forgiven you. He just wants you to accept his forgiveness. God has already gifted you. He just wants you to accept his gift. The finished work is finished. It's done. There's nothing else left to do. And you, and I'm, and, and I'm saying this not just to the saints, those who are in Christ, but I'm saying this to y'all who don't know him. That, that, that you, I'm just going to put it out there. You don't have to worry about hell. A, a loving God is not, gonna, is, is not going to burn his children for eternity for making 70 years of bad choices or 20 years or 10 years or whatever it is that, that, that you, you just cannot make that case. And I want to shut that discussion down once and for all. Because if you, if, if, if you are walking around in fear that you think that God is going to smack you on the head take things from you, and then possibly send you to an eternal barbecue where, where you're the meat, 
Because see, going to, an eternal barbecue ain't so bad as long as you're not the meat. But if you're the meat in the barbecue for eternity, that ain't cool. And, and if you believe that, I, I hope that what you heard today will relieve you from that burden and lift that fear away from you. Because the thing is, we're not supposed to be walking around with the sword of Damocles hanging over our head. Yeah, that's another work of fiction. Hell, as we understand it today, is a work of fiction that is designed by vengeful men to control people. That is it. That is it. And, and, and once you get past the fact that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. And when you get to that, you understand that there's absolutely nothing for you to fear. God loves you, and so do I, and that's what I have for you. Listen, you can uh, get connected with me at www.derrickday.com. I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer all of your questions, any of your questions. If you want to connect with me on Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash Derrick Day Ministries, or you can reach me on Instagram or on Twitter. My handle is Agape Dominion. And, and I would love to hear your questions, love to hear your comments, or if you just want to cuss me out, that's cool too. I, I, I've, I've had worse. And, and, and let me just say that for, for, you know, well, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> it, but if you want to, if, if, whatever you want to say, I'm open to hear it and, I, and I'll discuss it with you. But one of the things that I will not do, I will not joust with the legalists and I, and I will not have these theological debates. If you, if you really want to learn, if you really have questions, legitimate questions, I'm more than happy to answer them, but I'm not going to, I'm just not going to couch a bunch of uh, theological uh, histronics and gymnastics, I'm not doing it. Okay. So that being said, God loves you. And so do I, I have nothing else. I'm going to go ahead and shut it down. <laughs>